Hello. I am pleased to welcome you all to this Producers Guild of America conversation about Vivo with producers Lisa Stewart and Michelle Wong. Before I introduce our moderator, a quick note of appreciation and gratitude to our friends at Netflix for making this panel possible. I'd love to welcome John Cohen, our moderator, who has produced films including Despicable Me and the Angry Birds movie and has worked at Illumination Entertainment, 20th Century Fox Animation, and is currently at Sony Pictures Animation. He was the founding chair of PGA's Animation and VFX Committee and is currently working with Sony on his next feature film projects. Thanks very much to the three of you for being here and John, take it away. Great, thanks Diana. Um, and thanks everyone who's watching this. I'm John Cohen uh, and I'm excited to introduce the two incredible producers of Vivo, Lisa Stewart and Michelle Wong. Um, before we get started, I wanted to quickly tell everyone about your backgrounds. Um, let me pull it up. Uh, Lisa Stewart, prior to producing Vivo, was a producer at DreamWorks Animation and produced Turbo, Madly Madagascar, and Monsters vs. Aliens. She was also an executive producer on This Means War. Lisa graduated from Stanford University, began her career at Sony Pictures as an associate producer on Jerry Maguire, and she also co-produced Almost Famous, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Uh, she produced I Think I Love My Wife and co-produced Herbie Fully Loaded. Michelle Wong was one of the very first employees at Sony Pictures Animation, joining the studio back in 2002. She went on to serve as the visual development coordinator on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, an editorial APM on Hotel Transylvania, production manager on Hotel T2, and producer on Surf's Up Wave Mania, Surf's Up 2. Um, and Michelle graduated with a degree in graphic design. Well, thank you guys for being here. Um, first of all, the film is fantastic. I, I absolutely loved it. And it is so gorgeous visually. It's such a charming story. Um, and the, the emotion lands so, so beautifully. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the origins of the film. Um, I believe this was an original idea of Lin-Manuel Miranda's, um, but I would love to hear from you guys how the project came together and, and how both of you got involved. Uh, yes, it, uh, it was uh, an original idea with uh, Lynn back over a decade ago now, I believe it is. Um, and uh, it was floating around DreamWorks for a while and then uh, after many years of some development, it, it got picked up by Christine at Sony. Christine, I had recently left DreamWorks and Christine brought me on early. It, you know, at that point she was just like, you wanna make a Lin-Manuel Miranda musical? And I said, I do, I would very much like to do that. And so I, I came on early, uh, Larry Mark um, originally had the project with Lynn uh, and I, I had worked with Larry back on Jerry Maguire back in the day. So I've known Larry for a long time. And uh, and then Kirk D'Amico, our director came on uh, shortly thereafter and Michelle came on almost um, simultaneously or immediately mm -hmm. after that, right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's um, great. Was, was, Kirk, was Kirk a part of it back at DreamWorks or, or did, was he brought on once it came to Sony? He was brought on once it came to Sony, Larry, Larry, I of course knew Kirk from my time at DreamWorks and Larry actually had been developing a different project with Kirk and Christine had produced The Crudes, which Kirk had directed. And so there was a lot of organic overlap there and a lot of faith and trust in him. So he was sort of a, an obvious choice to come on. Awesome, that's great. Um... Well, the the filmmaking team and everyone everyone who who, who really was was instrumental working on it. Um, from from what I can tell, it it looks like people who had not worked on a, a musical before, at least an animated musical. And um, and I was wondering how you guys approached staffing up the show and 
and getting everyone moving in the same direction? And, and was everyone who came on at least a, a big fan of musicals? Um, you know, I think first and foremost, our approach was um, to find um, creatives that, you know, the director um, that could help execute the director's vision and that had, you know, previous experience with the directors. Um, you know, for visual development department, we wanted someone who um, could speak to the Latin culture, but also um, someone that could execute um, Kirk's vision of um, kind of combining a, a graphic look um, and also a good visual storyteller. Um, the same with editorial, you know, we found someone that Kirk had worked with before who, and who was really um, great with working with songs and editing music. Um, she was really helpful in the process as far as, you know, when we didn't have the actual um, demo, um, she was able to find a song and um, as a temp um, for you know our current cut in the movie and we would work with that it would give us kind of the tone and the feel of each um, moment um, and the same with story we actually did find um, a few artists that had had experience in um, musicals and um, we actually found one um, at Disney named Carlos Romero who had experience in musicals but was also uh, Lynn manuel fan and left Disney to work specifically on Vivo because he was so excited about the project. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Um, so I would say it was a sort of a combination of, you know, Michelle finding really great people within Sony and Kirk, you know, bringing in people that he'd had a prior comfort level with. And then and then I think everybody just, whether they had musical experience or not, is excited to Take on a challenge like that. Totally, totally cool. And 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 from from your perspectives, what were some of the biggest differences? I, I I've never been a part of making a musical, and so just curious, like what were some of the big fundamental differences between making a musical versus a non-musical? Uh, for me, I mean, the closest I'd ever come to making a musical was working on Almost Famous. And, you know, in that situation, we had a band that played a bunch of songs in the movie. Those songs were written well ahead of time. They were recorded well ahead of time and they were locked. And so when we went to shoot, we pressed play and that we had to match that song. Uh, this it felt much more like workshopping like how you would workshop a musical or a play. I, having never done one, this is what I assume it's like, but because the songs, there was much more fluidity in, in, you know, the songs as we got going. I think also like, you know, realizing how much um, the songs were important to the narrative of the story and advancing the story. Um, it was because the songs were um, already um, had been written at least in the beginning, um, you know, trying to mold the story or to fit the songs was really difficult because at the time they had different, when they were written, they had different meaning than they do now in our movie. So it was a constant evolution. Oh, that's interesting. And so did the songs all, had they already been written before before you guys started working on it, or were there songs that that were added, you know, in in the development process on the the Sony side? Um, oh. Both, yeah. We were given um, when we, um, you know, bought the um, script. We, it came with, I think it was ten or twelve original songs, Lisa. It, it, yeah, around there. Oh wow! And and were there elements from from most of those songs that that ended up in the the finished songs? And were there some that stayed pretty much the same? Or or how did how did they they evolve in the process? There were some that got cut immediately <laughs> because <laughs> wow. we knew the 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 version of the script that came over from DreamWorks. We knew we were going to make some pretty significant changes to, and so there were. It was more of a it was more of sort of a animal-based story. Um, and hmm. 
you knew we were going to bring more human characters into it. So those, so there was like, uh, I don't know how many, but probably at least three or four songs that like didn't make the first round at all. Hmm. And, and the rest we definitely tried to keep and build off of. Oh, very cool. And, and so what were some of the, 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 the early changes that, that you guys made once you, once you took over and, and, and started developing the movie? Was it was, basically, was it bringing in that, the human character, the, the, the girl character and the... Yeah, the, Gabby and Marta were two of the, you know, biggest, most significant changes. I mean, early on, Kirk felt very strongly that we needed like, you know, female characters to help anchor this movie and real human characters and people that the audience can relate to. And so those were two of the biggest uh, initial changes right off the bat. And, you know, we, as we said, we sort of excised some of the, some of the other animal characters. We kept Dan Carino. He was great, mm. <laughs> but <laughs> the other ones, the other ones sort of, you know, pretty quickly went by the wayside. And that was, that was definitely a, uh, uh, one of the first big sort of temple changes that we had. Yeah, I and think we, in order to, um, you know, it was pretty clear we didn't want to make it a traveling singing animal mu movie. And also we knew that the movie wanted, we wanted heart and in order to execute, um, you know, that emotion, it was important for us to include um, hu human characters as well. Hmm. Andreas was always there, but the the uh, Marta and and Gabby were brand new. Hmm. That's great. That I mean, that's, a, that's such a huge part of the story. So that's a, a significant development. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, um, also wanted to ask you guys um, just because I think that that sometimes this is this is interesting just in terms of how the process works. You mentioned using temp songs that, that would be placeholders for, for a sequence, would, would those be songs that you would board to and actually create a sequence using an existing song? And, and would you then show that to Lin-Manuel Miranda? Would he use that as the basis of creating a new song? Kind of like a, a composer will work with temp music to create you know, the actual score. Yeah, that was exactly how we worked um, using temp um, songs. You know, the editor helped find a song that we thought, um, you know, emoted the feeling of the sequence and what the characters were trying to say. Um, and we would board to it um, and hoping that the tempo um, would be correct. Um, and that was our way to um, discuss with Lin-Manuel if this would be an appropriate moment for a song and to musicalize the sequence. Because, you know, also with the musical, the pacing of how the musical numbers um, are placed within the movie um, is very important. You don't want like five songs in the first sequence, in the first act, and then no songs in the second, and then two at the end, you know? So, it was always uh, really challenging for us to find a good, happy medium. And you know, when you're, as you know, in animated movies, when you when you're previewing something, it takes a while to get these songs. You know, it's it's a big ask of of Lynn to come up with a brand new song that helps move the story along. But you have to preview these movies, and you have to, you know, you have to keep putting the movie up. So sure. you need to put something in there to give you that feel, so you understand, like you know, this might not be the song ignore the lyrics, but feel that this is the, this is the vibe. And that, you know, that was specifically very true for Gabby's introductory song and the love song at the end. Like, oh, you know, many, many times we would just have like a, a, a panel or, or a board that would say, tell the audience exactly how they should be feeling at this moment with, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, temp music in the background to emote the, the, tone of the song. Wow. It, was it hard to, to board those, those musical sequences? I, I would imagine that it was just such a, I mean, any sequence is hard to board. It's always such a, an iterative process, but are there any specific songs that, that kind of went through an interesting creative evolution or development process that you guys could, 
could talk to? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> they all, they all, they all went through many, many, many iterations. Um, there are many that are boarded and that the audience will never see and never hear the songs. I mean, we boarded, you know, a few songs, countless number of times. And then towards the end, we finally realized that we have to cut this song no matter how painful it was and how much we love the song. It was just, we all, you know, took that step and, you know, had to move forward. We, we sort of, you know, I mean, Lynn in a way gave us permission to do it. Like we, you know, you're really reluctant to cut his songs, but then every once in a while he would, he would look at the cut and he'd be like, you know, bah, bah. This just isn't, this is, this is old. This is from another version of the movie. Like, we'd let it go. And, you know, Michelle and I would be like, but it's so good. <laughs> and we're not talking about months. We're talking about years. Like, you know, a couple of the songs we worked on for two years, three years before we decided to cut it. So that's how, you know, emotional it was letting go of these beloved songs. <laughs> And, and when you're working with someone like Lynn manuel Miranda, any single one of those songs could potentially be a classic song that generations will love forever. And here you are making the decision, well, nope, no one will hear it. So that's a and tough it was decision. Never, yeah, and it's never, you know, and they're his songs. So it was never our decision. It was right. always, you know, uh, uh, us as a group and mostly him deciding that this, that we all got to move on. Right, right. Got it. Um, well, I'm still, I'm still never going to get over one of them. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. <laughs> any, is there any plan to release any of those sequences or, or songs? Uh, I don't think so. I think I think we talked to Lynn about it at one point, and he says, you know, they live on that. That song will go back in a drawer, <laughs> and it'll it'll get reconstituted somewhere else, just not in our movie. <laughs> Got it. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, question for you guys from a, a visualization perspective: the, um, the the design and the the aesthetic of the movie is so gorgeous and unique, and has such a great original style. Um, and and the movie is set in in I think four very distinct real world locations: um, Havana, Key West, uh, Miami, and, and Everglades, and and I was curious, how did you guys approach representing those locations so they'd be, you know, not only recognizable, but, but, but live together within the overall look of the film? I mean, you know, first, I think, you know, because the locations um, are all really visibly distinct, um, we kind of just, you know, looked at each location and actually amplified um, what it represented and, you know, the beauty of each location um, so that when you would um, go from lo location to location, there was a visual reset. Um, if you look at, you know, you think about Miami and you think, you know, what is so distinct about it is like the, the, the neon lights, the, um, the bright colors, and, you know, and then you think about the Everglades, it's, it's the beauty of nature. Um, and, you know, Key West is, is known for being a very kitschy, tourist-driven um, um, city with a lot of, lot of bright whites. So, you know, Carlos Zaragoza, our production de designer, just leaned into those um, aesthetics, you know, and, and, and as far as um, Havana goes, you know, there's a, there's a mix of um, old and new, so he really leaned into the textures. Great. Did, did, did you guys or Carlos, did anyone get to visit any of the locations as, as research or was it all done through through COVID and, and, and kind of via, via photos? I mean, I mean, luckily this, uh, we did go on the research trip before COVID. Um, okay. So, you know, there was a group of us, the directors um, and uh, VFX soup, as well as um, Carlos, we went to, um, Cuba, Miami, and um, the Everglades, and um, you know, did met with um, cultural historians as well as um, Everglades um, um, and then Everglades um, professional who took us on the a, a guide that took us on the tours. Um, you know, talked a lot of 
a lot to us about um, the wildlife. Um, and then we did, um, you know, some research in Miami as well, which was so helpful. Like, I think we came, we, I, we probably took thousands and thousands of pictures between all of us. Oh, that's great. Was there anything you learned about the wildlife in those visits that actually informed who the characters were, what the creatures were in the movie? Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of the animals that are designed and in the Everglades are, um, all, you know, animals that we did see and wildlife that we did see while we were there. And and the guide was sort of in, 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 a, some, in a small way an inspiration for the characters of the Sand Dollars and their, you know, passionate defense of life in the Everglades. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, because Elaine, our, our guide, um, she was, um, you know, an environmentalist and talked to us a lot about um, different issues in the Everglades that, you know, she was very passionate about. Awesome. Well, just on the visual front, um, Sony Animation is now known for being a studio that allows filmmakers to explore new and exciting visual styles for their films, like Spider-Verse or Mitchell's versus the Machines, um, and now Vivo, wanted to know what were the goals and, and challenges of working with the, the various departments to achieve different looks for the certain, you know, specific musical numbers, um, since those had such great, unique styles to them and are so so memorable. I would love to hear how you guys approach that. Um, you know, we first started off with um, our VizDev department um, and thinking that, you know, we wanted a different visual style for um, every musical sequence. Um, and, you know, with that idea, talking to Carl Herbst, our VFX supervisor, you know, and understanding what that meant for the um, ImageWorks pipeline meant, you know, it could be for uh, three or four different pipelines, which, you know, would be uh, very, very complicated. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, what's that, Lisa? It's a, it's a big ask. Yeah, it's a, it's a big ask. But, you know, after, you know, um, after we got into it and realizing, you know, kind of that we wanted to approach a 2D look for some of these sequences, especially um, Mambo Cabana, um, but not actually, you know, going into actual 2D, um, Imageworks found a way to use um, the CG characters and make it look 2D. So in order to do that, we actually needed to design um, two versions of each character and how we wanted uh, the CG version to look and the 2D version to look. Um, wow. And most importantly, keeping it grounded between those two environments. Like once you jumped into the fantasy version of the sequence um, of the musical sequence where it, you know, went into the 2D look, you know, we didn't want it to make it, we didn't want it to jump so that you would feel um, detached from the characters. That is really cool. So when you guys were looking at the animation dailies with Imageworks, were you looking at actual CG versions of those 2D sequences that, that just got lit later on into 2D or, or would you look at it in what looked like a, a 2D form? You, you, it looked like, it looked like a 2D form. We knew what it was. We knew it was going to evolve as it got lit, but you were getting a good sense of, of, you know, how it was going to play out in the final version. Kirk always wanted to, you know, take advantage of everything that animation can do in these musical sequences. He wanted, you know, he, he, he definitely wanted to push the envelope and, and Carlos and Carl were, you know, super up to the challenge. I think that I think they really at the end of the day it was a lot of work, but I think they really enjoyed putting their mark on it in that way. It's I mean the, the movie is just so beautiful. I will continue to say this, it, but it, it it looks unlike any other movie you've you've ever seen in animation. It is that distinctive and and you feel like you're you're in a new world and and experiencing something for the very first time, which is incredible. Thank you. 
Um, well, would love to talk a little bit about the cast. Um, you guys have such an awesome cast. It includes so many legendary musicians in, in, in musical roles like Gloria Stefan and Wanda Marcos and of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, just curious to hear, how did you guys put together this cast? Um, we, you know, honestly, it was funny because it wasn't, we weren't totally sure at the beginning that Lynn was going to voice Vivo. We kind of all danced around it for a little <laughs> while. You know, he had written it so long ago. And I can tell you, Michelle and I were always like, I hope he wants to do it. You want to do it, right? <laughs> it took a little while. I think he wanted to... I think he wanted to see what goods we could bring before right. he actually committed. Like, would you agree, Michelle? Yeah, like we, we, we definitely, he wasn't, he didn't commit to voicing Vivo in the beginning. So it was always a question mark for, for a good year. Yeah, and we were like, I think he really wanted to see that we could bring it. <laughs> and then I, think, <laughs> then I think once he saw that we could bring it, he came on. And then, it, you know, in the meantime, we, uh, we worked with Sony Casting. Uh, Tamara Hunter was the one that brought Wanda Marcos to us. And he was one of those guys where like, the second she played a tape for us, we all sat in the room and we're like, yeah, that guy, <laughs> that voice, that is exactly what we want. And then, you know, Gloria Stefan is also sort of a no brainer, but she wasn't an easy get either. We had, we had to woo her. She, uh, she's an incredibly talented and busy person. And we had to, you know, not take no for an answer, but then she, you know, we're, we're so, so unbelievably happy that we got her. And then, uh, you know, Brian Tyree Henry has a classical uh, background. He came from Yale School of Drama. He's a beautiful singer and, and just hilariously funny. And then Yanarli, yeah, Yanarli is um, just, she's a find, man. She was, we, we looked at with her. We initially looked at a bunch of kids in LA and, um, you know, of course there's a ton of talented kids in LA, but there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a Disney TV thing that's going through there. And, and mm -hmm. we quickly decided we need to, um, you know, widen our net. And so we uh, put a bunch of kids on tape in um, Miami and New York. And then we went to New York and brought in a bunch of those kids and you know, Arlie walked in and just popped. I mean, she is like, first of all, she's hilarious. She's su super energetic. She's totally funny. And she just has a great voice. I mean, she just has this very unique voice. And we we loved her in the room. There are other, other kids that we loved too. But then when we came back and cut her against picture, it was, it was a no brainer. And, you know, she was very green at the beginning. Brandon and Kirk did a great job with her. She just got better and better as the um, process, you know, proceeded. But she was, like I said, once we once we heard her cut against picture, we were we were all just like, "Yep, haven't heard that kid before." That's that's the kind of voice you want to hear. It's she just has just a great voice. She's got and a great voice, but she also pops with so yeah. much personality and energy and holds her own with these legends. And so, you know, and, and by the way, in, in many scenes, she is, is, is just the most charismatic, charming part of it. And was she, was she a singer before? Had she, how was that process with, with someone who was kind of new to, to voice acting? I mean, that Linda was another right. challenge. Go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah. Linda had to write for certain voices and then you can speak to Alex. Mm. I'm sorry, would you say Lisa? I said, Lynn, Lynn, you know, we said, we asked Lynn about it. We said, she's not a real singer. And he says, don't worry. I know how to write. I know how to write for non-singers. And then uh, Alex Lackamore, our executive music producer, you can speak to that, Michelle. Um, you know, Alex, um, you know, listened to her voice and, you know, was in the studio with her um, from the beginning and, and, and kind of just supported um, and leaned into, you know, what Inarli is capable of. And he really, um, Worked with her very closely. Did 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 Lin Manuel Miranda? Did he work with any of the actors when they were recording their stuff, or was he just focused on on, on his recordings and his stuff? Or, or, um, no, um, Lin, Lin Manuel and Alex went into the studio with Ian Arley um, when they first recorded um, "My Own Drum." So mm -hmm. um, you know. Alex kind of worked with um, Inarli in rehearsals and then Lynn um, 
showed up for the actual recording and um you know he had a huge influence on how um she would sing the vocals because for him um from you know after working with him there, he has a definitely a specific idea of how everyone should sound and how the lyrics should be spoken hmm well, that's that's really cool um wanted to ask you guys uh since you, you were in the middle of, of full production when the pandemic hit, as, as everyone has now experienced, that that managed to slow down and, and, and stop a lot of a lot of productions over the past year and a half. Um, but you guys kept moving full speed ahead and got this film made, which is extraordinary. Um, and I'm curious to hear just how you guys had to adjust to to do that. I mean, you know, as you, as you know, the voiceover uh, recordings were, you know, the mo were at first the most challenging, but, you know, er everything just became 10 times harder. Um, but, you know, being a musical, you know, the voiceovers are one thing, but being a musical, having to record all of these songs remotely was the biggest challenge. Um, wow. You know, the process was, um, you know, we, um, Alex and I and um, his team would do rehearsals with actors that we had they had never met or, you know, or we had never met in person. So we would do rehearsals over Zoom. Um, Alex's um, coordinator would actually set up time beforehand even to, to walk through everything. Um, and then, you know, the actual recording process itself between the vocals and the songs, um, you know, Alex was at home at Zoom and the artist, um, was in a studio by themselves and you know it's really hard to tell the sound quality from home and you know just hoping for the best at times um as far as the musicians go you know they were they all recorded um in booths um separately um so some days we would do you know the strings and some days we would do the horns we could never do it as a group um so you know the the schedule for recording songs and score um was definitely longer than we had expected um like for an example of you know the chorus um the chorus all the cor the um talent that sang the chorus were in one huge room and they each each um person was separated by a partition with Alex in the middle in you know in this really huge room that is incredible and so the entire score was recorded individually with each each instrument um not individually but like we they would do um strings on one day and you know only have people that played the strings in the room but all separated um yeah. you know by like little they you know each of them had a little pod or some type of partition but you know you couldn't have the 90 piece orchestra in one room wow we were able to do uh we did i mean just as an example of how different it was we had we were able to do Juan and Brian Tyree Henry in one day in Los Angeles pre-pandemic. And then the last thing we got to do before we shut down was go to Miami and do Gloria. And, you know, those guys are all pros. So we were able to, we were able to do that. We were able to rehearse and do them sort of together tightly. But then when, and then after we did Gloria, like literally, you know, a couple weeks after that, that's when we shot down. And after that, Michelle and Alex and the, you know, the music team at Sony had to just like the logistics and the, it was a lot. They did an amazing job and it was a lot. I mean, that is such an undertaking. And, you know, and by the way, with a movie that is very much about communication, you know, <laughs> abilities and inabilities to communicate, that's clearly one of the defining elements of how you guys had to make the movie, which is kind of weird that that, that, that would happen and, and, and you guys just rose to the challenge. That's incredible. I mean, it was, you know, it was definitely a challenge, but also, you know, we were also grateful to, you know, know each other and be working during the pandemic that, you know, we all we all kind of leaned into it. And you guys also had a choreographer 
that, that worked on the movie and, and, and choreographed some of the musical sequences. How did that work during the pandemic with dancers and was that done mostly beforehand or was that done throughout the process? Um, yeah, um, our choreographer, Calvin Hodge, um, we actually got most of our chore choreography done before the pandemic. Hmm. Um, so um, that made it a, a lot easier for us. But there was definitely a few pickups post, hmm. post and pandemic. Would, would those so reference in pandemic? Would, Hmm. With, with the reference videos of the choreography just go to each individual animator? How, how would an animator work when they were doing, I guess, a section of a, of a, a choreography or of, of a dance scene? Well, you know, we had asked Calvin to, um, you know, we would show him specific um, sequences and ask him actually to choreograph the entire scene. Um, given that we did this, um, or a lot earlier, you know, some of the scenes change. So as we move forward, um, the animators would choose certain areas that apply to the scene. Um, but we also asked Calvert to um, give us some choreography that were specific to each character so that each character would have a standout move um, that would be, that we could um, use in the movie. Um, so yeah. Vivo, Gabby and Andreas all had um, signature dance moves that, that that we use in each of their sequences. Oh wow! And um, you know, Sony ImageWorks is phenomenal, and I think you know, creating some of the the best animation uh, in the world today. And so much of the character animation in this film blew me away. There, there is a scene in, in act three when, when Gabby is, is in the car with her mom and she's really emotional and crying. It was one of the most beautifully animated shots I've seen. And I, I'm curious to know if there were any, any stylistic objectives that you guys had when you were starting to, to work with ImageWorks on, on the approach to the film's animation overall. I mean, yeah, you know, you know, our, you know, first and foremost, we wanted the characters to be grounded so that, you know, they could emote the emotion and, and the audience would feel that emotion. Mm -hmm. um, but we also worked with, um, you know, for um, our Latin characters, you know, we worked with our consultants on trying to get um, the nuances of um, someone being Latino and how they speak, um, especially when they're speaking Spanish or how they, you know, how um, the tendencies of um, Spanish speaking characters um, and translate that to animation. Um, and the same goes with um, Vivo. Um, we wanted, we didn't want him to be too human-like. So um, kind of weaving in the nuances between an animal and a human were, um, looked looked at um, constantly, like it, it, shot by shot, we always, you know, th th there was always the question like, is Vivo too human-like? Is Vivo too, too an animal-like in this scene? You know, um, so that was a constant conversation. I, I love the balance between seeing Vivo, you know, when he's talking versus when he's just acting the way a human would see him communicate. And, and they were both such, you know, expressive and, and, and charming sides of the character. And that's something you normally don't get to see with a, an animal character in a movie, which was really cool. Yeah, yeah that was, go ahead. It was something that it was something and, you know, it, it was one of those things that we had to figure out early on what that balance was, what those rules were, how that was gonna work. It was, you know, trial and error for a while, but you know, what, when to chirp, when to talk, what the <laughs> rules were. And then, you know, in, really loving. In animation, you know, um, the idea of animating a kinkajou, there's so many, you know, fun characteristics that we thought, you know, would play really well and appeal to, you know, especially kids, you know, seeing those specific little nuances of how a kinkajou uses his tail. Mm. Great, great. Um, well, this question, I, I think um, I wanted to ask you guys, I always 
for me, leads to some interesting stories. Um, but for, for both of you, what would you say was a big breakthrough that you had in, in the making of the movie? Was there, was there a specific scene that you landed or a moment or a set piece? Um, I, I find that, that there are always those moments in, in the making of a movie that either you know, come along and help to define the overall tone of the movie or the, the comedic sensibility or somehow just allow the movie to turn a corner. But were, were there uh, examples of, of, of an interesting story for, for, for both of you? Um, you know, early on, early on in the development process, it was the, you know, losing the other animal characters and bringing in Gabby and Marta. I think um, the idea of the, the song that it's that Vivo's mission is delivering this love song that represents a second chance. That was a big turning point for us because, you know, A, it was a musical, we didn't have that initially. And then, you know, honing in on a song and honing in on this song as a second chance. Vivo needs a second chance. Andreas needs a second chance. Marta needs a second chance. Gabby needs a second chance. It just like cracked things open thematically for us. Um, I also think uh, we did a lot of trial and error with a villain, and we we kind of spent a lot of time trying to come up with a, a you know an arch you know a real villain that was pressing against our main characters on their journey. And mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, we we went down a lot of roads, and then we thought, but it's the stakes in this movie are not about a villain. The stakes in this movie are emotional. And once we gave ourselves the freedom to get rid of a, a villain, it, it really just helped us, you know, dive into the real emotion of the movie. That's really great. You, you never once even think about the need for a villain watching the movie. You're, you're just on the edge of your seat, to, hoping and praying that they get, that they get the song to, yeah. you know, to, to this concert. So it's, it, it works really, really nicely. Someday we'll, someday we'll tell you about the, the past <laughs> characters and villains that we had. We went down some, we went down some many roads. <laughs> Every single time there are yeah. roads that you go down and, and yeah. you get to the end of them and you're like, why did we just go down that road? <laughs> it resulted in some really terrific character designs. <laughs> <It really laughs> did. Right. Yeah, speaking of, you know, songs on the cutting room floor, I'm sure there's yeah. some some gems of characters that will find their way into your other movies. Sure. Um, well, um, th this question I wanted to ask you guys um, as it relates to the PGA, um, something that I find every year when, when people are voting for the PGA awards um, is, is I often hear people ask the question, well, how do you judge good producing in animation? You know, how do you evaluate the producing of, of, of one animated film versus another? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times the, the, the award for best animated film goes to sometimes the most watched film or the, the, the highest grossing films, um, but, but not necessarily the best produced films. And um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you guys think are, are good attributes of an animation producer. I mean, you know, we all know awards are super subjective. <laughs> They're, you know, they, they are people, people vote for what speaks to them. And um, I don't know, I, I think that, I think that for me, you're looking for something that's fresh and innovative in terms of storytelling and, and visual development. And then you know, we also know that everybody, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you have been asked this question a thousand times. What does a producer do? Sure. And it's a hard question to answer, but for me, it's just, you know, it's supporting the director's vision. It's figuring out how to, you know, push the envelope without blowing up the schedule in the production and hiring the right people and letting them do their job. And that's, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you vote for that. I just know that's what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, finding a crew that you can trust, but also, you know, um, whether the movie is successful or not in the end, um, you know, I think it's ha having a crew that is happy and that that are proud and, and pleased to be working, you know, have worked on the film. Yeah, 
Yeah. Absolutely. That is, that is sometimes the most important thing. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, there's so um, many factors in what makes a movie successful, you know, right. and not you, as a producer, you can only control so much. Yeah. But what you can control is a, you know, to Michelle's point, like, taking care of your crew and getting everybody on the same page and, and having people at the end of the day, you know, be proud of the experience of, of the, making the movie and the work that they've done. Well, uh, one last question for you guys. Um, with, with all of the, the, the animated films and, and series that are in production now, you know, I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, working in the PGA, uh, who, who aren't working in animation or are, are interested in, in, in getting into it. And I was wondering if there's any advice that you guys have for, for someone who, who wants to get into animation. I mean, I think, you know, animation is a, you know, a whole different beast than, than other scenarios. And I think, you know, it's the classic of just networking and talking to people and understanding the actual process and what it entails. You know, animation is a very long, long process and um, it takes, uh, and it's really detail oriented and uh, it just takes a certain type of person to want to be involved in that. Yeah, and as somebody that came from live action, you know, I definitely felt like I had to learn a whole new language. Um, but that being said, you know, it's still super collaborative and super creative and, you know, it's the cliche of it's a, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And, <laughs> and if you're, and if you're interested in it, you, you know, talk to people that have been in the trenches because it's, 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 a, you know, it's just a different set of challenges, but also equally rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you guys so much for doing this today and, and huge congratulations on the movie. It's, it's exciting. It must be, you know, just sitting here where the world is about to see it. And, and, uh, and I'm sure that the next couple of weeks are going to be super busy for you. Yeah, we can't wait. We're very excited. Yeah, we, uh, we're thrilled. It's finally getting out there in the world. And thank you so much for having us. <laughs> thank you, John. Of course. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you for watching. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.